Brother Jackson, and brothers and sisters. <clears throat> it's with uh, pleasure and joy in my heart that I appear to give this last speech of the evening and the first uh, address to our affirmative that the employment of musical instruments and the singing of praise does not transgress the law of God, is in harmony with the faith of Christ, and is inoffensive to God. Of course, it is a very serious allegation, as I'm sure you must know, to refer to Blakely's antinomianism, lawlessness. Very serious uh, allegation indeed. Of course, my life is open to your examination to justify that. Uh, having made that allegation, you have, of course, uh, subjected yourself now to the evaluation of God himself. Be very careful about calling any one of God's people lawless. Now, you say that you'll predict that I will not give a scripture, so, of course, that, so that obviously means if I do that you were a false prophet. Because if someone says something's going to come to pass and it, uh, it doesn't as he said, so that would be all we would need there to just negate everything that you have said. My proposition is in the present tense, but my arguments are in the past. I thought for sure you folk would laugh at that one, but you didn't. Because I mentioned in the proposition the law of God, the faith of Christ, and God himself, and I, those are awful contemporary. Those are present, they're not in the past. Law of God was given in the past, but it's not in the past. It's still today for the lawless. That's what Paul said, the law is for the lawless. For the disobedient, murders of mothers and fathers and so forth, still there, can't get rid of it. If a person doesn't want to live by faith, the law is still there to condemn him. Stop his mouth, make him come guilty before God, still there. Faith, well, there's nothing more contemporary than faith. And Galatians, the second chapter, in verse 16, is that objective or subjective? Is that the faith that justifies? Is that objective or subjective? Uh, you will be I would be interested to hear your comments on that. And as God himself, uh, God has not changed. He declared, I, the Lord, change not. So if I can, in fact, establish that it is inoffensive to God, I shall have established my proposition. So the weight of that responsibility is upon me. Now, I'm under no obligation to harmonize my position with my father, Brother DeWilt, Brother Dunning, or anyone else. And I, I don't believe I've offended them at all in saying that because they are under no obligation to harmonize theirs with mine either. We are under obligation to harmonize with no one but God. And please don't try and bind any other type of harmony upon us or reflect upon the integrity of people because they don't. If in Christ the thrust of the covenant has become participation instead of doing, or to put it in words of Galatians 2.16, if instead of being justified by the deeds of the law, we are justified by faith, which joins us to God and to Christ, we are children of God by faith, for we were baptized into Christ Jesus. If, if faith makes us a participator instead of a doer, then the thrust of the covenant has been changed and we are judged differently in Christ Jesus than by the deeds of the law. What I'm saying is that walking by faith and living by faith is not walking by doing and living by doing is living by possession of the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Now I understand that it comes through the gospel, but it has to get from the gospel page, as it were, into your heart and that's where God writes it upon your heart. Incidentally, If the law is written on the heart merely by instruction, why, pray tell, didn't that, uh, wasn't that accomplished under the old economy? God sent his prophets rising up early and testifying wonderful things to his people, but it never got upon their heart. What is the difference in Christ Jesus? How did it get there in Christ and not under the law? Give us scripture for your proposition. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing. Now, remember, my proposition is this, and I've been dealing with the first part of it, which is that the use of instrumental music and singing of praise does not transgress the law of God. 
I have shown the law of God, what the apostles identify as the law of God. I have shown that the law of God was given to the accompaniment of trumpets, which obviously could not have contradicted the law. That which transgresses the law cannot be sanctioned as an accompaniment to its revelation. If so, God would be inconsistent. And concerning this very law, this law that came by Moses, the apostle says in Romans, the seventh chapter, verses 12 and 14, that that law which convinced him of sin, and he identifies what it was, thou shalt not covet. So it was part of the Ten Commandments that you say had been done away. And Paul came to Christ quite a time after the law had been nailed to the cross, that that law was holy and spiritual and just and good. And my proposition states that the use of instrumental music does not violate or transgress that holy, just, spiritual law. That while that law convinced Paul of sin, and it said, Thou shalt not covet, that law cannot convince a person of sin that uses a musical instrument. That's the point I'm making. It's not possible for a cursed object to be used to reveal spiritual truth. Now Paul says in Romans 7 14 that the law, and he tells you what it is, read the chapter and see. He said the law is spiritual. That is to say it conforms to God's nature. And instrumental music did not transgress it on the very day that it was given. Now if you will go through those commandments, and incidentally, remember the Sabbath day. Have you never read that there yet remaineth a rest to the people of God? That there is a Sabbath that wasn't fulfilled by that seventh day? And that we're entering into rest? Hebrews, the fourth chapter, that is the Sabbath that was typified by that earlier Sabbath. There yet remains a Sabbath to the people of God. A, a Sabbaton, a rest. The commands that were in that Decalogue of having no other gods before me and not making a graven image and not taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain and remembering the Sabbath day and honoring the father and mother, not killing, not committing adultery or stealing or bearing false witness or coveting. Not a single commandment dealt with how to worship God. It dealt with the attitude and perception toward God. Now we know this is true because Jesus himself summarized he says, here's the summation of that law which Brother Heyer seems reluctant to accept. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is likened to it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I affirm that instrumental music and praise violate the first and great commandment only if it's used other than to God. Amos, the sixth chapter and verse five, which of old time was used by some that are anti-instrumental. It is not used so much these days. There God castigates a decadent people whose lips honored him, but heart was far from him because they invented to themselves instruments of music and gratified their own sinful lust instead of sending it forth to God. If, in fact, the use of instrumental music is a sin, if it violates the first and greatest commandment, if it does, that's the way it does, is by offering it to other than God. Sin is the transgression of the law, and God's law, the Word of God says, works wrath. Romans 4.15. Now, <clears throat> that's certainly not true of the law of Christ, or is, or is, Maybe I don't understand this correctly. Does the law of Christ work wrath? If it does, what have we more than we had in Moses? Moses' law worked wrath. Jesus Christ's law is not a law of wrath. It's a law that is internalized by the grace of God and makes the person himself compatible with God and reconciled to God. David put it in these words in the 27th Psalm. He said, when, thy, when thou saidst, seek ye my faith, my heart said, thy faith, O God, will I seek. 
David was a man ahead of his time, a man whose faith superseded and rose above the very covenant under which we, he lived. We know that's the case because Paul said we have the same faith that David had, the same spirit of faith we have believed and therefore spoken. David, ahead, ahead of his time, if you please, said, I know what it's like for my heart to be in agreement with God. I'm saying that the use of instrumental music does not violate or transgress the law of God which formerly was on stone but is now inscribed in the fleshly tables of the heart that it does not violate that at all, does not transgress it. I call upon my brethren to produce a law, a divinely articulated law, that the use of musical instruments transgresses, a law that works wrath and a, work that I, a law that identifies sin by which comes the knowledge of sin and stops the mouths of men that all the world become guilty before God. And if no such law can be produced, then let God be true and every man a liar. Now the second part of my proposition is this, that the use of instrumental music in praise to God, singing of praise harmonizes with the faith of Christ. Faith in Christ, as I have stated, which results from an embrace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a persuasion of heart that is created by a belief of the record which God has given of his Son and conformity to the form of the doctrine which is embodied in Christian baptism, the form of the truth, the actual participation in the death, we die with Christ, the burial, we're buried with Christ, and his resurrection, we're raised with Christ. Now, faith is what produces that sort of obedience, belief of the truth. Once a person comes into Jesus Christ, he has a living accomplishment of Gethsemane's prayer, where Jesus said that he prayed for those that would believe on him through the apostles' word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, uh, thou, thou in me, and I in thee, and they in us, that we might be one together. We have actually been joined to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now the faith life is the life that's lived out of that union with God through Christ Jesus. My proposition is that instrumental music to be proved sinful must be at variance with these eternal objectives that are achieved by faith, which is the remission of sins, coming to God, and an eternal inheritance, that they must conflict with that somewhere along the line. The emphasis of the gospel is, as you must understand, not upon duty. The emphasis of the gospel is upon Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I affirm that the use of instrumental music does not interfere or conflict with faith. We know this is the case because great men of faith such as Habakkuk, who said that the, although the fig tree does not blossom, neither fruit be in the vine, he continued that great uh, extolling of God, said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation, and this grand expression of faith concluded by saying, I deliver this to the chief singer on my stringed instrument. Now my point is that this Habakkuk expression was one of faith, that faith prompted that, and that the musical instrument harmonized with it and did not violate it. This is, of course, Abrahamic faith which justifies the conviction that what God has said is true. Habakkuk's faith was not prompted by the old covenant. It was prompted by his persuasion of God, and it was in perfect harmony with the employment of a musical instrument. I'm before you for the last uh, address of the evening and for further denial of the proposition that has been read in your hearing and which Brother Blakely obligated himself by his signature to affirm tonight. It is my judgment that he has utterly failed in the affirmation of his proposition. Uh, he certainly has not dealt with any of the matters that I have presented in the negative. I presented a number of counter arguments on charts and otherwise that he has uh, utterly failed to mention, much less to answer. And so we've come to the end of the first evening of his affirmation without any scriptural satisfaction whatsoever.
I thought I heard him say a time or two in this last speech that he was going to give us that passage. And my ears perked up and my anticipation grew and I waited and I waited and I waited. <laughs> but I never did hear it. He said uh, when he first got up here that I said he would not give the passage and he said therefore he gave it that he would uh, make a false prophet of me. And I suppose that sympathy welled up within his heart and he just didn't want to do that to me and so he never gave the passage. And then I thought I heard him say another time that, uh, all right now, I'm, I'm getting ready to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. And uh, I, I got all tensed up and teed up again and uh, I, I waited. He never did give it. And that question mark that I had on this chart over here and that we had also up here is still there in talking about all of these different defenses that have been made across the years on instrumental music. They've gone to the Greek. They first said it was required by the Greek, mandatory. Then they said, no, we don't want to say that, but it's permitted by the Greek. And then after a little while, uh, they came along and said, well, no, it's just an aid. Uh, it's not really in the worship at all. It's just an aid to the worship. And then, as I pointed out, uh, they came along with one of the weakest arguments ever devised and said, well, there's no authority for congregational singing. Like the two little boys, you're a liar, you're another. All right, you don't have any authority for congregational singing. We don't have any, current, any uh, authority for uh, instrumental music. Uh, as if uh, it related only to congregational singing. That's why I said that argument doesn't touch top, side, edge, or bottom of the proposition because we're saying not any authority of any kind for the use of instrumental music in uh, praise and worship unto God Almighty. And then uh, disciples of Christ just go off out beyond any scriptural authority at all say it doesn't make any difference. We'd like to be like the Baptists and the Methodists. And uh, Brother Blakely objects to the term antinomianism but we'll uh, demonstrate that that is a correct assessment of his position. He's come along now and just said, we don't need any regulation, don't need any authority whatsoever. But in the center, I have that question mark that says the real issue is, where is the New Testament passage? And the question mark still stands. Now, he's gone through his affirmative tonight, and I believe presented as little information on the subject as I've ever heard or read in any debate on this subject just has not given us the information. He has not given us scriptural authority. He has not provided us with one single solitary argument of substance to defend the practice of using instrumental music in the worship of God. And I don't believe that the people in this audience could uh, take a sheet of paper and write down for me any argument that he's made that would defend the use of instrumental music in the worship. I just don't believe it could be done. He has not given us anything. He's talked about these philosophical uh, ideas of his. Uh, he's given discourses on passages that even if we were to admit everything that he said about it would not establish his proposition. And uh, so as we come to the end of the first evening of his affirmation, he's utterly failed to do what he came here to do. Now maybe tomorrow night he'll do better. He reminded me early on tonight that we do have two nights on this and perhaps he just wanted to wait till the very last to give us this information. We'll see whether or not that's the case. All right, he objected to the reference antinomianism, uh, which uh, he said uh, called him a lawless person. But the antinomians uh, were those who were against law. And that certainly uh, has been indicative of his position. Here's his worship is unregulated, no authority is needed. It is an antinomian position. I didn't say anything about him personally. I'm talking about his position here. That's exactly what he's taught and what he says. He says, uh, I am not obligated to harmonize my position with these others. I'm not obligated to harmonize my position, he said, with my father, Fred O. Blakely. I'm not obligated to harmonize my position with uh, Dwayne Dunning or with Don Duell. Brother Blakely, I understand that. I don't believe that he has really seen what I'm trying to establish by this. I believe you see. I think the audience understands. But Brother Blakely never has come to grips with it. And he said uh, that he does not question the integrity of these brethren, nor do I. Nor do I question your integrity. That is not the point of it at all. I do not say that you are obligated to harmonize your position with these others. I do say that you ought to be honest enough to come up here and admit the difference. You haven't done that. In fact, you told us last evening that you were all united. Well, now that isn't so. 
you not only are not united, but your position nullifies theirs. They're not consistent. They don't mesh. That's the point I've been trying to make. If his position is true that there is no authority necessary, that worship is utterly unregulated, that there is no definition in the Scripture for worship, even though I showed uh, that his father speaks of John 4.24 as that comprehensive definition of Christian worship. And he objected because I cited the footnote from the American Standard Version. He says, I will not accept a footnote as authority. He won't accept any Greek authority. He doesn't accept Thayer, one of the most eminent in the world. He does not accept the translators of the American Standard Version, of which Thayer was one. That footnote down there is simply a reference by the translators regarding the meaning of the word. That's what he asked for was a definition. The word that is used there is a Greek word. All we have is the English translation. The Greek word there is proskuneo. And the translators in a footnote said, this is an act of reverence. He said the first night that the Bible does not speak about acts of worship. Now, Brother Blakely, right here, I didn't contrast you with Fred and Don and Dwayne and Julian. I just gave what you said. And he hasn't had anything to say about that either. I believe he did refer to it and said, well, I just meant that it was, I don't know what he said about it. I think he said something about it. <laughs> Whatever it was, it didn't deny what he's got up here. <laughs> Worship can also be used of individual acts of homage. I know that whatever he said, he was not able to deny the force of that, if he referred to it at all. And so I've shown what worship is, but his position is it's not defined, it's not regulated, no authority is needed. He doesn't give any, he doesn't have any. Well, you cannot harmonize that position with the efforts that they have made in the past where they tried to prove it. Brother uh, O.E. Payne tried to prove it by the Greek saying it's in the scripture. The Greek word includes it. It's mandatory in the scripture. And others have tried to show that it's allowed by one or the other of the Greek words and so on. Well now his position, what I'm endeavoring to show, and it's a legitimate point, is they fail because there is no authority and there is no authority needed. In fact you remember that he said here uh, one evening that the very idea of regulated worship is a contradiction. So I'm not impugning his integrity or the integrity of these others, but all I'm asking him to do is admit honestly that if his position is true, it falsifies the efforts of all of these who preceded him in their efforts to defend instrumental music. They cannot be harmonized. There's no way that you can put them together. And uh, it's of interest to me that he takes this position. I cannot uh, conceal from you my interest, if not my delight, at the position that he takes. And I'm certainly happy that this discussion is going to be printed in book form and made available in years to come because it'll be quoted and cited by my brethren uh, for time immemorial to show that in this discussion he has wiped clear the slate of the efforts of all those who preceded him in their attempts to defend instrumental music. It is significant. Then he came back to this reference to the law of God. What did he say about the passages that I gave? In 1 Corinthians 9, 21, it says, we are under law to Christ. Now, what did he say about the reference that I gave to Romans 7? He went to Romans 7 and talked about the law being holy and good, something which I would never deny, which I am perfectly willing to concede. But he did not go to the verse just a few passages prior to that, which I cited, in which it is said, We are dead to the law. Wherefore, my brethren, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And yes, it is true, Brother Blakely, that that is the context where he also quotes uh, some of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and thus that is the very law to which he says we are now dead. 
Oh, yes, that's the very point of what is being said here. And in verse 7 he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Yea, I had not known sin, but by the law. I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not cut. And then he said, uh, Do you not know that there is a Sabbath that remains uh, for the children of God? Hebrews 4, I certainly do. But the Sabbath that remains in Hebrews 4 is not the Sabbath of Exodus 20 and verse 11. And that you're trying to bind upon us the Decalogue and the Sabbath that is in Exodus 20 and verse 11 is the seventh day Sabbath. And the, the verse itself says so. The Sabbath is the seventh day. It's not the one under consideration there. If you want to bind the Decalogue, you don't have to deal with the seventh day Sabbath and the Adventist work you over good. <laughs> Take that position. He talked about the first and greatest commandment, love the Lord thy God. And how do we show that love? John 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He said, uh, show me the law that instrumental music transgresses. And I tell you that he's on the wrong track. He is in the affirmative tonight. And it is his duty and his obligation to show us the law that authorizes it. And I have asked for it, and I have begged for it, and I have beseeched him for it, and I thought in his last speech that he promised that he would give it, and of this good hour we have not heard it. His is the responsibility tonight, and I've emphasized that again and again and again. I want you, brethren, to think about this. We're talking about something here that has caused division among those who ought to be united. We're talking about bodies that once were one. There was a time when the uh, Christian churches and the churches of Christ, as it were, were one body. There was no such thing as uh, that organization to which he now belonged. None of us used instrumental music at that time. Alexander Campbell said to all spiritually minded Christians, such age would be as a cowbell in a concert. I have shown you the statement that was given by J.W. McGarvey in which he said that it is an abandonment of the restoration plea that we cannot go out to the world and plead with them to give up those things for which there is no scriptural authority when we ourselves have adopted and inaugurated those things that fall in the same class and the same category. And I'm saying to you tonight, it is a shame. It is a pity. It is a disgrace that this divisive doctrine has divided people who ought to be one and has torn asunder the body of Christ all over this land and country on no more basis than what we have heard tonight. We must be divided and split asunder over this. Oh, what a shame. Oh, what a pity. I don't know how brethren can pillow their heads in sleep at night knowing that they perpetuate a division which rests upon such a frail reed. There's Brother Jackson and men and brethren. I count it a privilege to stand and give a defense of my employment of musical instruments in the praise of God. I know that in my defense and presentation, I have presented you with some things that may have sounded strange to your ears. I have, I can only ask that you consider it I have sought to speak as the apostles have spoken. I wanted to deal with, with something, uh, a few things before I get underway here tonight that were of some concern to me. I have already uh, spoken to Brother Hires about this. I have been uh, prompted by this association of my name with antinomianism or the without law, spirit of lawlessness. I had thought not to say anything about this, uh, Brother Allen, but a couple of people inquired of me last night uh, under suspicion that possibly I uh, was a person that indulged in self-appetite. 
Now this is not, a, not at all the case, of course, albeit I, as I thought upon it, I found that I was in a rather elite company, having been charged with this. Uh, to be in all honesty with the potentiality, I believe is what Brother Hires meant to say, the pot the, my position potentially could lead to antinomianism or lawlessness. Uh, this, of course, is the situation that the Apostle Paul found himself in in Romans, the third chapter and verse 8. He said that they had been slanderously reported as some affirm we say, let us do evil, let good may come. His following phrase is very harsh. I hesitate to say it because I really do not mean that to be applied to to Brother Hires, whose damnation is just, it, uh, that part of it I am not appealing to, but the, the gospel of Paul was misinterpreted by the Jewish legalists. <coughs> they thought he was teaching a gospel that permitted people to indulge in things that were unlawful. I am suggesting that the gospel that Brother Hires has presented to us this week could never be so taken. I also want to address a statement that was made that said I was trying to bind the Decalogue, Ten Commandments, on the people of God. Not, not at all so. That has already been bound on men by God, and it is only loose in Christ Jesus. We have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, and only through the body of Christ. And incidentally, we have become dead to the law that we might be married to another law, that we might be subjected to another law, or no, that we might be married to another, even to him whom God has raised up from the dead. So we have exchanged a legal code for a person, and that is the gospel that I am proclaiming. And rather than it leading to antinomianism, or to lawlessness, or to a refusal to be under law, it has led me into an arena where I earnestly desire that whatever I do, whether in word or in deed, I want to do it unto my Lord, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so I have imposed upon my own conscience a law to God that says the grace of God has taught me through the gospel to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Why? Because I want to. I have found in Christ a hatred for sin that is far superior to a law. And it can keep you, bless God, from antinomianism. Now, Brother Harris mentioned that the issue of loving God. He said the issue is how you love God. No, I emphatically deny that. The issue is whether or not you do love God. The evidence of loving God is keeping the commandments. But the emphasis is to love God. That is the point of Scripture, to love the Lord thy God. My point there was that the knowledge and love of God is, of course, superior to mere law and ordinances. <coughs> Now, it's challenged to show that the law authorizes, that Christ's law authorizes my use of instruments of music. Well, I have denied the principle of authorization as stated. I am saying that, no, that is not the case. I do not have to have authorization from God to worship him. I have cited, and still this has not been dealt with, of that woman that brought an alabaster box to Jesus, broke it and anointed him with it, unauthorized, never commanded, no precedent, nothing in the scripture that permitted such a thing, and Jesus received it, and wherever the gospel is preached, that unauthorized deed by an unauthorized woman at an unauthorized time is preached in memory of her. Not to mention the lady that washed Jesus' feet with her tears, an unauthorized act, wiped it with her hair, an unauthorized deed, yet it was received of God. And on and on we could go that David's desire to build a temple was unauthorized. God did not permit him to build it, not because it was unauthorized, but because he was a bloody man. But God did permit the building of Solomon's temple and Zerubbabel's temple and Herod's temple, and none of them were authorized. He only authorized the building of the tabernacle. That's all. Solomon changed the dimension, made it twice as much, put windows in it when the tabernacle didn't have windows. 
He put a court, uh, porch on it when the tabernacle didn't have porch. He changed the layout of the tabernacle, uh, of the temple, and yet God approved of it and filled it with his presence. The same with Zerubbabel's and even Herod's temple. It was made much larger than Zerubbabel's. It was larger than Solomon's. It was approved of God. All unauthorized. Now, brethren, someone has to face that. This is God we're talking about. God is on trial here. God has presented himself as having approved something that was not authorized. We have three temples we know weren't authorized. They were suggested originally by man, and God blessed them. We have a woman with an alabaster box, unauthorized, and Jesus Christ, who's the express image of God, and in whom dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, received her worship. I would appreciate dealing with that. I was charged with having embraced a divisive doctrine, a dreadful doctrine, and an eloquent plea, and I can appreciate the plea, to abandon the employment of instruments of music so that we could again be united. <coughs> Back as far as 1986, there was an estimate that you brethren had 18 divisions among you by one of your own brethren. Another brother back in 1969, I'm not naming their names because I think I do not think it does them any service to name them, name them, because they lamented the fact I do too, so it shouldn't be their names should not be mentioned. 38 divisions. And uh, another brother mentioned 48 divisions. Now, what, what would get rid of those? If I gave up the instrument, would that solve these other divisions? And if it wouldn't, is the instrument the divisive issue? Come now, we, we've got to be honest and have integrity when we face each other. We are faced with a prolific number of divisions. And I simply refuse to take the credit for all of them. Some of you folks have to take some of the credit so I expect that you will be taking this subject up. Being as there is such an earnest quest for unity, I'm sure you'll be taking this quest up. Incidentally, we are not debating the restoration position here. Now, I reread the propositions. There's no reference to the restoration position here, that we're trying to harmonize my position or your position with the restoration movement. That is not our position at all. So there, where they stood and what their objectives were are really irrelevant at this point. It's the scripture that we're dealing with. That's our comparison. As best we can, we're trying to make a comparison with the word of God. So let's, uh, let's not have uh, the traditions of men brought up. And however hallowed the men are, if they're post-apostolic, they're the traditions of men. Now I have asked that we have some place in scripture where God refers to an element of worship. And we still haven't, uh, we still haven't had that. And that basic affirmative proposition of the first two nights depend on there in fact being an element of worship if there isn't any such thing defined in god's word as an element of judgment you can't judge me with that term now you may have that opinion you are at liberty to have that and i'm at liberty to not have it but you can't judge me with that opinion you can't isolate me from the rest of God's people with that. You can't evaluate the validity of my worship on the basis of a nomenclature you created. Totally inadmissible in this movement. I have asked whether true worshipers are acceptable. The Lord Jesus Christ in John the fourth chapter, text has come up repeatedly here. Fourth chapter, verse 23, Jesus says, the hour is coming and now is. It's here. When the true worshipers shall, not ought to, shall worship God in spirit and truth. Because that's the kind of people God's seeking to worship him. God is the spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now that text, verse 24, either can mean one of two things. Brother Hines and a great number of people spread across a great number of camps are of the persuasion that it means that God has a legal requirement that men worship him in spirit and truth. You see, but that's not my position. Now, whether you determine my position right or wrong is beside the point. I want you to understand why I say this. The reason why God 
Those that worship God must worship him in spirit and truth just because there isn't any other way to worship God. God is a spirit. That's why they must worship in spirit and truth. And Jesus said, I am come to induct a period of time when this is actually going to occur. When men are going to worship God in spirit and truth, it's really going to happen. Not that it should happen. Seems that's a very important distinction to know. <clears throat> there have been repeated references to these two terms, New Testament and worship. I want some place, some scripture, for my own sake, where the Holy Spirit uses those terms like you're using them. Some place in the Word of God where God employs the term New Testament. See, we've built a lot of concepts around it. We've said New Testament church, New Testament worship. I want how does the Holy Spirit use that term? And if he doesn't use it the way you use it, I don't care whether the declaration and address had it or not. If it's not in the Word of God that way, let's have done with using it that way. If God did not employ New Testament the way you're using it, think of another way to say it, Brother Hyde. Say it the way you mean to say it, but don't tag that on God and don't judge me with that nomenclature. The Holy Spirit does not use it that way. Now I want to further develop this idea that authorized approaches to God are not necessarily required. That every time someone offers something to God, it has to be approved. Early in his ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ made a pronouncement that was absolutely revolutionary, particularly to the Jewish community. He said, whatever enters in a man's mouth doesn't defile it. Revolutionary thought. The gospel writer Mark, in the Mark 7th chapter, verse 19, said, now he said this, cleansing or purging all me. All me cleansed by the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, sanctified by the word of God, as it were. Some one decade after the day of Pentecost, Peter is on a housetop meditating and praying when God lets the sheep down with some unclean animals in it and commands Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Peter said, not so. Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. This is a decade after Pentecost, and Jesus had purged all meat sometime before that. God said, don't you call unclean what I've cleaned. Don't call it common or unclean. I said, get up and kill and eat. Before the day was over, Peter got the point. So here he refuses. He refuses to let Peter look at meat in an unclean manner. Obviously typical of the Gentile world. Later to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, verse 13, Paul makes this announcement. He says, meat are for the belly, and the belly is for meat. But God's going to destroy both it and them, so don't make a big deal out of it. Later in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, in verse 3, the apostle says, God, because some people commanded to abstain from meat, that became a religious tradition. There were some of the first anti-people. They were anti-meat. They really were. They commanded to abstain from meat for whatever reason. And the apostle says, he has commanded. There it is, the specific. He has commanded that meat be received with thanksgiving by them that believe and know the truth. Now along comes this believer, whether you're young or not, I do not know. But he flies right in the face of what Jesus said. He flies right in the face of what God revealed to Cornelius. He flies in the face of apostolic instruction, and he says, no, I will not, I cannot eat meat. I can only eat herbs. The categorical word of God, Romans 14 and verse 3, of this man, who were he judged by the exclusionary principle or the rule of authorization would have been chastened, the word of God is, for God hath received him. Now, someone reading this may say, Aha! 
But that was a personal matter. Well, what is worship? Impersonal? Is it? Someone else said that was a matter of indifference. It didn't make any difference. Didn't make any difference. Why it's associated in Romans 14, verse 18, with serving Christ. Read it. Read the text. Read it. Become familiar with it. Be like Job and desire his word more than you're necessary. For what I, that, that's or I shouldn't say it. It's just oratorical. I, surely you do already. Read that and you'll see. He's serving Christ. He's acceptable to God. This is in the context there. 18th chapter, Romans 14. He says that he speaks of one person edifying another by considering each other in this dilemma where one person says, I can't eat it, another person says, I can't eat it. And the Lord says, watch out. Don't you condemn each other. Don't do it. Paul goes even so far as to say to the man that knew he could eat meat because Jesus pardoned me, because God commanded to be received, he knew he could eat them. He said, now consider this fellow, don't destroy the work of God. Well, that's, that's strong language. Destroy the work of God? That's strong language. This very meat situation. Not only that, but he says the person that's eating is, is eating of faith. Faith is the thing that prompts him to do it. And he adds in verse 23 to this fellow that doubts that he can eat meat, he's damned if he eats. Now, brother, I don't know how much more serious you can get than that. We're talking serious stuff here. Not matters of indifference. <laughs> Not at all. Whatsoever is not of faith, that's the text he's talking about. Huh? This is the text he's talking about. Romans 14, 23, about this guy that felt he couldn't eat meat. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This fellow was not permitted to defile his conscience. For that reason, I would never think of binding my view of the instrument on you. I want to make that clear. That my position is not that you have to use the instrument. You are not permitted the luxury of defiling your conscience. <clears throat> now, this is not the language of indifference. It is exactly the opposite. It is, in fact, worship is, in fact, the issue. Because he says, he that eateth not, eateth not to the Lord. Now, I hope there's no one here would affirm that's not associated with worship in the term way we've used it here in this debate. And he that eateth, he eateth to the Lord. He elaborates even more. He says, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. It's connecting this now with the Lord and our association with him. It's even related to the death and resurrection of Christ. For to this end, Christ both died and resurrected and revived and rose that he might be the Lord of the living and the dead. He's still talking about this same, this same issue. Nothing could be further from being indifferent. Now, let's don't quit there. The chapter goes even further. This is talking about doing something to the Lord. It's, these are in the text, Romans 14. This is talking about giving God thanks. Anyone here disassociate thanksgiving? See, and I know you say, well, that's not the assembly. Brother Harris has already told us that we're not debating the assembly. He's already said that. I thought at first we were. Am I not right? I thought at first we were talking about an assembly, corporate assembly. He said, no. It applies to anywhere you're at. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the individual worshiping God, and there isn't any other kind, as far as I know, in the Scripture. Either the individual worships God or he's not worshiped. They who worship him, not collective altogether, they're, they're comprised of individuals that worship him. Here's a person that's living unto the Lord, whether we live or die to the Lord. Here's someone fulfilling the end for which Christ died and rose from the dead. He died to be Lord of the living and of the dead. And here's a person with a weak conscience, can't eat meat. He says, I'm going to still not eat it unto the Lord. He's my Lord. My understanding may be deficient. I may not see it like you see it, but I'm going to honor God in the way I see it. And don't you dare force your view on me and try and make me serve God against my conscience. God will judge you if you do. Just as yourself, I'm serious about serving God. And I know you, you wouldn't be here if you weren't. And I, I, want, I do want the pause to commend you for being here. This has been an exemplary audience. You have manifested to this community that you have an interest in these things. 
So I'm not at all deprecating you. This is talking about standing, in this text, standing before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for ourselves. The man that didn't eat under the Lord is going to give an account just like the other one. Is it possible for anything to be more critical? Serving Christ, being acceptable to God, edifying one another, destroying the work of God, being condemned or not condemned, sin resulting from not a faith. Enough of that, uh, enough of that issue. Uh, my point is that this fellow's position was not authorized and yet he was received of God. That's the text of Scripture. Now I think, I know some of brethren here have some unique abilities in playing a musical instrument. The question arises whether you can use that to God or not. Now I think we have an index to God's mind here. Now back in the prophet, God gave a lament to Ezekiel concerning the king of Tyrus, who had fallen from a lofty position. As he began to unleash the judgment of God against Tyrus, he spoke of Tyrus' lofty position and seemed like he began to reminisce and allude to uh, Adam and to possibly even Satan, for he referred to the Garden of Eden and the day thou was created. Now as God begins to contemplate these things and upbraid the king of Tyrus, he says, The workmanship of thy tablets and pipes were prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Ezekiel 28, 13. Now there's only one creator. There isn't any more. It's only one. God said that uh, that workmanship, that ability, that dexterity with the instrument, was created in him. Not only to enjoy, but to actually be endued to play the instrument. One man who excelled in this was David. He is called by God the sweet psalmist of Israel because he gave his ability to God. I suggest to you that the God that authored the ability would be a confusing God were he later to make it sinful in his worship without telling us so. After putting the ability in man, after upbraiding him for falling, then to forbid him to employ it in his own worship. This is one ability that then would be excluded from God. How much time do I have? Let me then refresh your mind with these things that I feel I require to proceed. Where God uses New Testament and worship, as Brother Hires does. And whether true worshipers do in fact worship God in spirit and in truth. Blankly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted by the opportunity to come before you again this evening on the final night of our discussion, and once again to stand in denial of the proposition that has been read in your hearing, and which Brother Blakely signed his name and agreed to affirm. I will reiterate again this evening what I said last evening. He has not done what he signed his name to do. I do not want to speak unkindly, but I give my judgment. Never in all of my experience have I ever heard a speech that was more unrelated to the proposition that it was designed to affirm than the one to which we have just listened this evening. And as evidence of that, I propose to you once again what I stated a number of times last evening. I do not believe that there is an individual in this audience tonight who could tell us how that Brother Blakely has proved that instrumental music is scriptural, and that is what his proposition says. He said tonight that I had asked him a number of times last evening 
to show that instrumental music is authorized. And he has told us tonight in no uncertain terms that he does not believe in the principle of authorization. I must say that it not only shocks me but grieves me to hear a man who says that he is a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ state before an audience such as this that he does not believe in the principle of authorization. Therefore, we may dispense with the idea that he is going to show us any authority for what he does. And we may as well give up now any notion that he is going to show us any authority for his practice. And we certainly understand from all he has told us thus far that he is not going to give us any authority for instrumental music in worship. He has made that abundantly clear. And I think that we may as well accept the fact that he does not have it. He cannot get it. He is not going to give it to us. He cannot give it to us. So let us dispense, at least for the moment, with the word authority. His proposition still says that it is scriptural. And I emphasize once again that his proposition is in the present tense, even if his argument is not. His proposition does not say it was scriptural. It says it is. To those of us who live under the new covenant, Therefore, I invite him to give us what his proposition says. He did not do it last evening. He has not done it tonight. And I am willing to predict that this debate will close and we still will not have it. I put a question mark over here on a chart involving defenses of instrumental music. I pointed out all of the different efforts they have made, most of them self-contradictory. And yet, in the center, I said, the real issue is, where is the New Testament passage? The question mark is still there. The passage has never been given. Now, Brother Blakely began tonight with reference to the term antinomianism. Because I said last evening that he holds a form of antinomianism in his position on worship. He came back and said something about that last evening, and I explained it, I thought, very adequately at that time, but now he's brought it up again. I stated to him last evening, and I don't know how I can make it plainer other than to state again that my reference to his antinomianism has nothing whatsoever to do either with his personal conduct or with his standards of personal conduct. I've made no allegations against him of that kind whatsoever. The term antinomianism is simply a term that means without law. And I have said that his position on worship is an antinomian position. And I believe that it is, and I believe that he has manifested that it is because he does not believe that there is any regulation of worship whatsoever. Then you remember last evening when he defined his proposition in which it is said that the uh, employment of instruments of music does not transgress the law. He defined the law there as the law of Moses. Most of us were surprised that he would use the law of Moses as the proof for his proposition. I pointed out that we are dead to the law by the body of Christ, Romans 7 and verse 4. He said nothing about it last evening. I used another passage about which he has still said nothing. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 21, we are under law to Christ. And we have asked him, we have pled with him, we have beseeched him to tell us about the law of Christ. 
But now tonight he says, yes, we are dead to law by the body of Christ, but only by the body of Christ. And he said, it is only in Christ that we are free from the law. And what we seem to be hearing here is a little bit of Reformed Calvinistic covenant theology. That we are under the old covenant and it convicts us of sin. And then when we are redeemed, we have the laws of God implanted in our hearts, seemingly by some divine illumination. And then we simply are led by that divine illumination into what we do, and if it leads us to instrumental music, so be it. That seems to be the drift of the argument that he has made. But in Romans 7 and verse 4, the Decalogue itself is quoted in the context. And thus it is the Decalogue or the Ten Commandment Law that is under consideration when it is said we are dead to the law by the body of Christ. And remember that Christ died upon the cross long, long ago, at which time the law was nailed to the cross and was taken out of the way. And thus it is that we are dead to the law by the body of Christ that we might be married to another. He said that doesn't say to another law. No, it says that we might be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. But I have already shown that we are under law to him who was raised from the dead. And about that passage, he has said, no, not a word. And then I thought it was quite interesting, even though we dealt with it earlier in the debate, and I presented a chart on it. He brought up again the fact that he denies the principle of authorization. He speaks about the woman with the alabaster box. He said there was no authorization. He uh, speaks about the woman who washed the feet of Jesus, though he says there was no authorization. He speaks about the temple. I want you to notice, by the way, that every one of these is an Old Testament example where he has been telling us all the time that there were detailed instructions. And it is only under the New Covenant that we do not have direct authorization. Yet he reaches back and gets his examples out of the covenant, which he has told us all the time is one that contains detailed instructions. And he accuses us of being Sinaitic because we're looking for detailed instructions about worship. And yet where does he go to find his examples where he says there were no details given? But here is the question that I've asked him about all of these arguments and about all of these presentations that he has made. How do you know, since practices do not have to be authorized to be acceptable, which ones of them are accepted of God and which ones are not? And I still have my rosary bead. And he has never yet been able to give any valid reason why that he can bring in the instrument and leave out the rosary bead. told us that worship is utterly unregulated. He has told us that we do not need authority, that he does not believe in the authority principle, and I placed a chart up on the screen earlier in the discussion to show that some of those who are identified with him in his position on instrumental music have already taken his position to its logical consequence and have said we cannot forbid the use of the rosary beads in worship. Now, he may not take that position, but I contend for your consideration that all these others have done is to take to its logical conclusion the very principles that he has already enunciated. And then uh, he again brings up the uh, fact of division among those of us who are opposed to instruments of music. But he fails to understand what I pointed out is they are divided over the very question that we are discussing. I never denied there were divisions. There were divisions in the first century church. That did not keep it from being the church that crossed the blood of the Son of God. And if somebody does not properly apply a biblical principle, it does not negate or nullify the principle. But they are hopelessly divided on the very position that is under consideration tonight. 
And I have shown that the position that he advocates in this debate repudiates and abandons the arguments that have been made by his predecessors who have attempted to defend instrumental music. And then he said, we're not debating the restoration movement. But we do believe that it is a New Testament plea to restore the New Testament church. And I asked him earlier, and I asked him again tonight with all of the uh, earnestness that I can convey, Brother Blakely, how can we restore something that was never there? How do you go to an unbelieving world out here and say to them that we're endeavoring to restore first century Christianity in this day? We're endeavoring to restore the New Testament church and then present to them something that was never in the New Testament church. How do you restore what never was there? And then he said he had asked me for an element of worship. Well, the problem with Brother Blakely is he continues to make the uh, same uh, speeches and allegations again and again, regardless of what I say. And even if I give him the passages, he pays no attention to them. I presented uh, Acts 20 and 7, where the disciples came together to break bread on the first day of the week. I presented 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25 in the imperative mood, where it is said, take, eat, this is my body, this do in remembrance of me. Uh, he said nothing at all about these, and I'll give him some more before our time expires. Then he emphasized again in John 4 and verse 24, true worshipers. But I pointed out that the true worshipers are those who worship in spirit and in truth. And to this good hour, he has not dealt with the concept that was presented on this chart, worship defined, having to do with worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And I have the language here that has been on the chart from the very beginning. Must be directed by and according to the truth. I don't care how you say it, that is regulated worship. And that is what the New Testament says. Our worship is to be regulated by truth. And the language that I quoted on the chart is from Brother Don DeWell in his book about the church and the Bible. And I agree with Brother DeWell. I think he's exactly right. I gave a quotation the other night from a Brother Butler who stands identified with them in his commentary on John published by College Press in which he said precisely the same thing about worshiping God in truth. And he has not dealt with it until this good hour. And then he spent almost all of his time on Romans 14. And he did not do himself any good with his proposition because no matter what he read, he has not been able to find anything that sustains the position that he's taken. And as a matter of fact, Romans 14 in the dealing of the eating of meat is dealing with a matter of indifference. And it's referred to in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 8 as well. Listen to the language there. Meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. And what is under consideration in Romans 14 is that an individual cannot violate his conscience. Amen. And thus, if an individual believes something to be wrong, he cannot do it and thereby violate his conscience even though the thing in itself be not wrong. If he uh, eats while he doubts, of course he does wrong. And there is not one syllable in anything that he presented from Romans 14 that will aid or help his cause in the defense of instrumental music. And then he referred to Ezekiel 28, 13 about the uh, pronouncement that is given there against the king of Tyre. And uh, he said if one has an ability, he ought to be able to use that in his worship to God. And he said, I know there's some of you here tonight that have the ability to play instruments of music. I wonder if we have anybody here tonight, Brother Blakely that has the ability to dance. David uh, danced before the Lord. Not only that, but in Psalm 149 and verse 3, he said, praise the Lord with the dance. I want Brother Blakely to follow his argument out to its conclusion and tell us whether or not he will justify the idea of the holy dance. Brother Jackson, hand me those two uh, files that are there on the table. Now, he also challenged me to show where that worship is ever used in the New Testament in the way that I have utilized it here. I have shown already what 
worship is in John 4 and verse 24, and I'm satisfied with that. Brother Fred Blakely, as I have pointed out, refers to it as that comprehensive definition of Christian worship. Not only that, but I've referred to what Brother Given Blakely himself has said, that it may be used of individual acts of homage or adoration unto God. And that is precisely the way that I'm using it tonight, and so I have good authority for so doing. I have John, I have Fred O. Blakely, and I have Given O. Blakely, because they've all used it in exactly the same way that I'm using it tonight. And then he wanted to know where New Testament was ever used as I use it. Well, it's used every time that I can think of in the way that I use it, but I'll give you an example of it. In uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, he has made us able ministers of the New Testament. And if you notice down in verse 14 of that same chapter, he talks about the reading of the Old Testament. That indicates that the Old Testament was constituted by the books of the covenant, and it is placed here in contrast to the New Covenant, and so let him deal with that. He says there's not a command in the New Covenant. He says the New Testament does not mean what we believe it does. I haven't seen him establish uh, anything by the way of proof about the way that he uses those phrases. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see his chart number 27. I'm interested in what he said about wanting us to show uh, what is meant by New Testament or by New Covenant. Let's just look briefly at his chart number 27. And I'm interested in pointing out how he uses the term himself. Let's get the top of it first. New covenant occurrency. And look what he does. Ananias and Sapphira, Hymenaeus and Philetus, Diotrephes, Corinthian fornicator, the church at Ephesus, and all of these different references to the books of the New Testament, which he says the New Covenant doesn't mean at all, and he refers to every one of them as a New Covenant occurrence. Thank you, Brother Blakely. You may remove that chart. Now I want to introduce a number of charts this evening that will deal with these matters that we have been discussing. Let me have chart number 20. This will show what I've said about his antinomian or no law position. On this chart, we have a quotation from Brother Blakely, Word of Truth, January 1988, in which he says, Observe that there are no commandments in the New Covenant, none at all. There's your antinomian position. But the Scriptures declare a law of faith, Romans 3.27. The law of the Spirit, Romans 8.2, that we're under law to Christ. 1 Corinthians 9.21, the law of Christ, Galatians 6.2, the law of liberty, James 1.25 and James 2.12, the royal law, James 2 and verse 8, the new covenant containing my law, Hebrews 8, verses 7 through 10. And then I've asked him this question repeatedly, and I'll ask again, is the Lord's Supper a part of the new covenant, and is it regulated by law? Let me have chart number 9. He's referred to this passage in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10, and he continually says that there are no laws in the new covenant. But watch what is said by the inspired writer. But this is the covenant that I will make. I will put my, look at that word, Brother Blakely, laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Now notice this. We're under law to Christ, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 21. And because the laws of God are in the heart, does not mean that we're without law, because David said in Psalm 119 and verse 11, Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Let me have chart number five. Now I want to show something about this idea of worship that he's talked about all the way through. And I want to emphasize here that I have said that even if we could not establish any worship in the assembly, it would not help him. Now that seems to be a misconception that uh, he and a number of others on his side of this issue have. They think that all we're complaining about is the use of the instrument in the assembly. I told him repeatedly that if he established that there was uh, no assembly of worship in the New Testament, it would not help him in the least because he still has to show that it is proper in worship or praise to God to use mechanical instruments of music, which he's utterly failed to do. But let's just notice Ephesians chapter 5. Notice in verse 18 you have the uh, imperative, be filled, pleruste, second person plural present imperative. Then in verses 19 to 21, you have five plural participles which have imperative force in agreement with the verb. Speaking, laluntes. Singing, adontes. Making melody, solentes. Giving faith, eucharistuntes. Submitting yourself, herposasonai. All of you, therefore, these are plural. The idea is all of you speaking, all of you singing, all of you making melody, all of you giving faith, all of you submitting yourselves. And then notice further that the speaking there is how toys. 
which is plural, meaning to yourselves, to one another. Thayer defines it reciprocally, mutually, one another. Give me chart number six. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. The word in you there is in whom in. That is plural, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. The word there is high too. In psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now notice to whom the Colossian epistle is addressed. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, chapter 1 and verse 2. Notice the language, let dwell, present imperative, in you, plural, that is, in all of you. One another, a reciprocal pronoun denoting an interchange of action, according to Dana and Mandy's grammar, page 131. Now summarizing what is stated there, one, Christians are authorized to teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Two, this instruction is addressed to all the saints and faithful brethren at Colossae. Three, the language includes the imperative mood, the plural number, and the reciprocal pronoun. Four, what occurred then when all the saints and brethren at Colossae taught and admonished one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in their hearts unto the Lord. Let him answer that question in reference to this particular passage. Yes. Let me have now chart number uh, 15. Brother Blakely has made the argument on worship that it is utterly unregulated. Stated in logical form, that is to say, conduct which is unregulated by the scriptures is conduct which gives Christians freedom of action. Therefore, uh, worship is conduct which is unregulated by the scriptures, and thus uh, worship is conduct which gives Christians freedom of action. But, chart 15a, I ask the question, will Brother Blakely accept the consequences of his own argument? One, this is Blakely's reasoning on worship by which he endeavors to justify the use of instrumental music and praise to God. But if Christians have freedom of action to utilize instrumental music, why do they not have freedom of action to utilize counting rosary beads in prayer? Why not dancing as an act of praise? Why not the burning of incense? If there's freedom of action, Brother Blakely, who is to say what acts may or may not be utilized? And tell us, please, on what basis is one to be accepted and the other to be rejected. Give me now a uh, chart number um, 37. Here is a chart that I've entitled the uh, Blakely Blunder. And here are a number of things that Brother Blakely has assumed and endeavored uh, to deal with in this discussion that uh, have been blunders on his part. Number one, he thought we oppose instrumental music only in the worship service. I pointed out to him that if we couldn't establish an assembly, it wouldn't help his cause at all. Two, he thought he could justify instrumental music by the nine saints are commanded to worship. Uh, that still would not assist him in any way. If the saints as a plurality were not commanded to worship, it would not give authority for the practice in which he engages. Three, he thought he could justify instrumental music by denying congregational singing. But I said he cannot prove it on an individual basis either. Four, he thought if worship was unregulated, he could get the instrument in, but he couldn't keep Roman Catholic ritual out. That was his problem. Five, he told us the other night that vain worship is not necessarily wrong worship. Brother Hires, Brother Jackson, and brothers and sisters. We are indeed under the law to Christ. Uh, it doesn't say under the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 20, 22. That, that's the wrong text for that. that. That text, law of Christ, is found in Galatians 6, 2. Now this one says under the law to Christ, and the very text Paul violated your concept of it. He became as someone without the law to those without the law, and as someone under the law to those under the law. In fact, in Acts the 18th and 20th chapters, he even submitted to offering a, a vow and an offering, shaving his head, keeping a temple vow, and appearing to a group of Jews at the request of James uh, to keep the law. He actually violated this... Uh, this law of Christ that you referred to. Now, the law of Christ is actually found in Galatians 6, 2. And it's the person who, if we bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. 
The law of Christ is the law of love, brethren. The same sort of love that God had for us and that Christ had for us. He loved us and gave himself for us. Or as the beloved John said, we ought also, beloved, God loved us and we ought also to love one another. And that's the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2, not 1 Corinthians 9. Under the law to Christ means servitude to Christ, a voluntary servitude to our Lord and Savior. His word is our back. The law uh, is not the Ten Commandments that condemns. Well, what law, pray tell, does condemn? What is that law in Romans, the third chapter, verses 19 through 20? That we know that whatsoever things the law say, that's the law of Christ, Did I, do I understand that right? What things whoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. Now, we're dead to the law, right? To the body of Christ. So that, that, according to your theology, can't be the, uh, the Ten Commandments or the law that was given by Moses, as John 1, 17 states. What law is that? It was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. Are you going to sit there and tell me that Jesus Christ's law is given to stop men's mouths and make the world guilty? Jesus Christ said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. I didn't come to judge the world. I came that the world through me might have life. Jesus' law doesn't make people guilty. It makes men free. He came to cleanse them and purge them before God. I am offended by identifying the law of Christ with condemnation and judgment. <laughs> Instructions are found in the Old Testament. Well, to begin with uh, Genesis through Malachi, are you saying that's the Old Testament? Second Corinthians, the third chapter, says the Old Testament was written and engraven on stone. That must, <laughs> that must have been some group of stones, 39 books with all those words chiseled on them. Just by mathematics, you know, that's 80% of your Bible. And I noticed over the chart over here, Romans 15, 4, I'm just going by your chart, Brother Hyde, because we're in agreement on this, 100% agreement that Romans 15, 4 is a good text for us. What things are written aforetime were written for our learning and for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come, unless we're talking about music, then they weren't written for our learning. <laughs> huh? Is that it? Such things are written, written for our learning. They're God's glossary. This is where God develops his concepts of sacrifice, his concepts of a mediator, of the blood, of offering, sanctification, justification, praise. They're all developed back there. The apostle said the only thing we preach is what Moses and the prophets said would come to pass. Acts 26, 22. That's where they, that, that was their Bible, you might say. They reached back there and expounded what was written back there. That's where the concept of praise was developed, my good brother. Now, Romans, the 14th chapter, I just want to hastily mention some of these things. A matter of indifference. Well, the fellow that was told, he that does is damned if he eats. He wouldn't think it was a matter of indifference, but now I will... I will concur with you that in one degree it was a matter of indifference because Romans, the 14th chapter, tells us there, the uh, verse uh, 14, I believe it says, I am persuaded that nothing of itself is unclean unless it's a musical instrument. That is to say, me. <laughs> well, it's obvious that when he says nothing is of itself unclean, that's exactly what, it, what he meant, that the determination was made by the person that the, by the person's conscience before God. He had, God does not permit you to violate your conscience, even though in the case of this man that ate meat, it was an imperfect conscience. And that's my, that's my whole point, that that defies the idea of meticulously regulated worship. That would not permit him that right. Now, 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 6. I, I commit the study of this chapter. This, ob this obviously, this new covenant, New Testament is like strange territory. And I don't condemn you for it because I remember when it was strange to me. But are you, I hope you're not saying that's Matthew through Revelation. Is that what he meant there? 
uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, because he said it's not of the letter. Not of the letter, what he said. And the new covenant, God has favored us with telling us what it is. This is the new covenant. Hebrews 10, verses 8 through 30. This is the new covenant. I will write my laws in their hearts. He didn't say the new covenant was the laws. He was going to write in their hearts. He said the new covenant was the writing of it in there. The fact that I will put the, the fact that I will make you compatible with my law. That you will be in agreement with what I say. That you will not be a disobedient and gainsaying people like Israel was. That's not the way the church is. Not at all. Moses, before he left this world, held out his hands to Israel. And he said, from the day I knew you, you've been a disobedient and a stiff-necked people. And God said, I have continually held my hands out to a disobedient and gainsaying people. But Jesus doesn't say that of the church. The church is not a disobedient and gainsaying people. They've been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. They've been translated out of darkness into light and they are not lawless. It's been written upon their heart by the ministration of the Holy Spirit, which the New Covenant is called here in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Now, my proposition is stated that the use of instrumental music, the employment of instrumental music and singing of praise does not transgress the law of God. I identify the law of God the way Paul did in Romans 3rd chapter. If you read Romans the 7th chapter, it's not the law of other hires that's dead, it's we that are dead. We're dead. The law's not dead. We are. We're dead to the law. We're the ones that died in Christ. He says in the 12th verse and the 14th verse of the same chapter that the law is, the law is, he says, not was. The law is spiritual, not was spiritual. That's why, you see, we rejoice that we're not under, because it's still very much, it's still very much out there. But in Christ Jesus, but in Christ Jesus, I have become dead to its condemnation. There is, it was given to condemn the world, that all the world might become guilty before him. But in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, because we're dead to the law, dead to it. Now, my proposition states that it did not transgress the law of God. I established that that's the law of God I'm talking about. If you can't see it, that's your problem. I do see it, so I'm free from that problem. You, you, you try and convince the people, I'll try. Let them be the judge. Whether the law of God that condemns is the law that came from Sinai, that genders bondage, according to Galatians, the third chapter, the law genders bondage, and it was gendering it back there in Galatia. Long time after Jesus died, long time after these Galatians had been buried with Christ in baptism and joined to him, the law was still gender and bondage. Does not transgress. There's no, nothing in God's law that condemns us. Maybe in yours, not in God's. God has, in the scriptures that were written for our learning, he had he has commanded the use of instrumental music both before the law psalms the 81st chapter he commanded it when joseph come out of egypt commanded it and he commanded it after the giving of the law and not in association with the law but in association with praise which was not an integral part of the law itself he commanded it in second chronicles 29 25 now you feel, why are you going back there? Because that's where the apostles went. When the apostles want to talk about faith, they went back there to Abraham. When they want to talk about hope, they went back there and talked about Abraham. When they wanted to talk about uh, having a spirit of faith, they went back and talked about David. We have the same spirit of this is where they preached from. Don't condemn me because I preached in the same place the apostles did. When Jesus was walking down the two with the two on the road to Emmaus, says he went back to Moses and the prophets and the Psalms and he opened up the things pertaining to himself. Well, he's still alive and the things still pertain to him and we can still learn. You're right, they were written for our learning. God's not counterproductive. He doesn't command something he hates. Not at all. Oh, you say, but there's sacrifices. There's bloody sacrifices. They were back there too, right? They sure were. And even back there, God said, listen, I don't delight in these sacrifices. Psalms 40 and verse 6. Even back there were they being offered. He said, I take no delight in these. These don't satisfy me. Not my order. He was looking to the Lamb of God that was 
world's going to take away the sin of the world. What I'm saying here is that God commanded their use and never countermanded it by teaching or by precept. And I'm saying that this part of the scripture is where he's developing the concepts that are employed by the people of God. It's, he gives the definition. This is God's glossary. A lexicon is not God's glossary. Restoration history is not God's glossary. It is not. A dictionary is not God's glossary. You want to know how God thinks, how God wants you to think, the terms he wants you to use? You'll go to his glossary. And back there in his glossary, the only thing that became invalid is what was fulfilled by the antitype. Like the ancient lambs back there, they were fulfilled by the Lamb of God. The burning of incense, which I don't know if any of our assemblies would do this, but that seems to be a great point of concern. This rhetorical question, what if we burn incense? Hasn't anyone ever wondered why we don't? Hasn't they? I'll tell you why. If you don't know why, I'll tell you why. Because we know in our heart, and when I say we, I mean all of us here, you're in Christ. We know that Christ has offered himself up to God, a sweet-smelling savor, well-pleasing to him, and we've got heaven's incense on our soul. It'd be foolish to burn any other kind. Those beads, that is a source of irritation, isn't it? I'm, <laughs> when, you, when you have a hatred for those things, I'm sure you do see that. I, you couldn't get one of those from our brethren, could you? I'm glad you brought them along. <laughs> I'm going to keep, I, I hate to talk, but I really do. This, this is offensive to me. And I'll have to repent of this when I get home. <laughs> and I will, this morning. <laughs> Almost like having an indulgence, isn't it? <laughs> but he had to keep count of the times I didn't answer his questions, and I'd have to keep count of how many times he's going over the same speech. <laughs> well, let's have done with that. God's not honored by that anyway. <clears throat> At the dedication of the temple of God, a remarkable thing happened. Second Chron uh, we're talking about God. God doesn't change. God says in Malachi, I, the Lord, change not. He has certain attitudes toward things that don't alter. I've shown you that in the matter of bloody sacrifices, he told them ahead of time, this isn't my will. Jesus said in Hebrews 10, he said, the burnt offering and sacrifices for sin now has had no pleasure. He never did, never did have pleasure. It doesn't say that, however, praise with musical instruments. It says here that the trumpeteers and the players and cymbals and the singers that made one sound, one sound to the Lord. Yeah. One sound to the Lord. You know what happened when it went up? Well, what happened to Nadab and Bayou didn't happen. When Nadab and Abihu offered up the strange fire, didn't take it off the altar, that fire that went up, that smoke went up, and fire from God came down. But when this uh, one sound, not two sounds, see? People have been taught there's two kinds of music. Some say three. Guess it depends who you talk to. There's singing, there's playing, and one person is singing and playing. Now, I don't know where that comes from. It didn't come from the Bible. The Bible says there was one sound. They joined us one sound. You know what happened? Glory of God come down fill the tabernacle. What's that mean? This is not strange. It wasn't strange not to God. If it's strange to you, that's your problem. But it wasn't strange to God. And it wasn't an association with a covenant. It was an association with praise. I think of that type, that, that minstrel uh, that came to Elisha. Elisha was a prophet. And he got ready to prophesy. Say, well, this is under the old covenant. This is under God. We're dealing with God here. Not a covenant. Prophecy wasn't a matter of the covenant. Does anyone here think prophecy was integral to the covenant? Not at all. The prophets prophesied ahead of their time. Elisha wants to prophesy. He calls for a minstrel. This minstrel comes in, starts playing cunningly, and says, wow, the minstrel played. The hand of the Lord was upon him. <laughs> How come the hand of you brethren are against me when I play? Why is it? Huh? I'm serious when I ask the question. I'm not playing any game here. This is no game with me. No game at all. Because if what Brother Hire says is true, God's going to damn me. He's going to send me to hell. Even though he's represented himself here as his hand being upon his prophet when a minstrel played. Huh? Nothing like that happened when David committed adultery. The hand of God wasn't upon him. He hated it. He even, he even told the Balakai, the prophet, I hate putting away, even though he tolerated divorce back there because of the hardness of the heart. He hated it. I hate it. I hate it. Never did say that. A praise rendered to him on an instrument. And you know, here's another thing. King Saul, 
King Saul, 1 Samuel 16, uh, verse 16 and 23, an evil spirit bothered him and uh, called for David. Didn't call him to come quote the scripture. Oh, David probably could have done it. He wanted to play. So he played cheerfully. When he played, the evil spirit left. I'm sorry, but I, that, that sets my mind to think it. Now, we have two instances in Scripture where instrumental music was repulsive. In the Scripture that was written for our learning, I'm learning from it. No one has any objection, right? You don't object if I learn from it, do you? Two instances. One here is when the devil didn't like it because it was played by a righteous man. And the other is in Amos 6, 5, when unrighteous people played it for themselves and not to God, and God didn't like it. So if I don't like instrumental music that's played to God, it makes me wonder whose side I'm on. You got a weak conscience in the matter? I don't condemn you. I really don't. I don't. But I expect you not to condemn me because I have a conscience on the matter too. See, don't rule that out, brother. Don't rule it out. I, no, I, I recognize your conscience on this and I honor it and I would not. I'd die before I forced anything on you. But I've got a conscience too. Don't ask me to violate mine. I think that's fair enough. Fair enough situation. Now I'm showing here that it's inoffensive to God. That's my point if you miss it. It's inoffensive to God. That was part of my proposition. It's depicted, musical instrument is depicted, how much time? It's being depicted as being in the immediate proximity of the throne of God. John, uh, he sees this, Revelation, the fifth chapter in verse 8, and there's four living creatures and 24 elders, and they are the highest, evidently the highest form of spiritual intelligences that have ever been created. And they're singing a new song around the throne. And it says they fell down. Every one of them fell down before the Lamb, and they all kept hold of their hearts. Now, they know the likes and dislikes of God. They know the likes and dislikes of God. And yet, uh, and yet here in God's presence, they are having their hearts. Oh, someone says, well, Brother Blakely, what does that have to do with us? That's up there. What is that? That's where I'm going. That's what it has to do with me. Jesus taught me. He says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he said. This is the college. I'm being oriented for that place. Now, does it, make, it doesn't make sense to me, all right? I speak just for myself. It doesn't make sense to me that God would orient me for a place that would permit what he outlawed here. Particularly when God didn't say he outlawed it here, gave no hint he outlawed it here, set precedence in the scriptures he told me was for my learning. The very scriptures that are for my prophet that Jesus talked out of, the apostles talked out of, and the early church depended on the Gentiles hearing the things that got out of those scriptures that were read every Sabbath day. Doesn't make sense that God had schooled my mind to think that way and then condemn me because I did on earth what was done in heaven. Brother, please. The apostles were authorized to bind on earth what had been bound in heaven. Heaven didn't bind what the apostles elected to bind on earth. They bound what had been bound in the later version. Tell you that. Now, I ask you this question. Is it possible? My proposition is that the use of instrumental music and praise to God is inoffensive to God. Is it possible that God would permit in his presence something that offended him? If so, then the death of Christ doesn't make sense because Jesus died to make us inoffensive to him. It just so happens that that's a part of God's nature. God cannot and will not change. He will not permit someone or something to abide in his presence that is offensive to him. So he had to purge us from our sins to make us acceptable. And he's already shown us that instruments have been acceptable in his presence.